Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Wild Hearts at Work podcast. I am your host, Melissa Boggs, and this week our phrase is psychological safety, a word we hear, a phrase we hear a lot these days, uh, especially as it comes to organizations in this post-pandemic time. And this week on the podcast, my guest has a lot of information and a lot of knowledge around this topic specifically because he is a behavioral scientist. So I am so excited to invite to the podcast my friend, Joseph Pellerin. Welcome, Joseph. Hi, Melissa. Thank you for having me here. It's uh, interesting. This is my first ever podcast. <gasps> Your um, first podcast. Yes. <laughs> well, I am honored to be your first host of your first podcast. Um, why don't we start by just telling folks, first of all, uh, a little bit about your background and what a behavioral scientist does. Um, okay, my name is Joseph, I'm Swiss, and the accent comes from being born in New York and growing up in Princeton. Um, but Due to some fortuitous circumstances, I skipped two years of high school, went to university at 16, went to Oxford the year afterwards, and then to Vienna, where I did my first degrees in psychology and music. Uh, I was lucky that my father's research laboratory was one of the first Unix beta sites, and that brought me in contact with computing and computers oh, wow. very early. So I think my first language was Fortran 4 on a PDP-11. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so I had done a number of things uh, during, tried out different careers and stuff, and ended up uh, in the mid-1980s getting a job with an insurance company who were looking for a psychologist who could actually program computers to do research in artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence back at that time was norm mainly something they called expert systems, trying to model the responses of an expert in a certain domain. And um, the one of the programming languages used back then was a language called Smalltalk. Now, through the Smalltalk community, which was relatively small at that time, I met some people who influenced me very strongly. One of them is a gentleman named Ward Cunningham, who I, if people don't know him, they should, because a lot of us use one of his creations every day. It's something called the wiki. Uh, <laughs> another one was my uh, friend and mentor, Kent Beck. And then in the uh, mid nineties, <clears throat> I got a call from Kent and Ron Jeffries who were um, starting a new project and they needed somebody to help them do some of the tooling for that. And that was also in small talk. And this, pro this project happened to be at Chrysler and it was the world's first extreme programming project. Dun, dun, that's dun, how, dun. I, that's <laughs> how I got involved into that movement. Uh, unfortunately, small talk never got the recognition that it should uh, as a programming language. And I moved out of technical consulting more into process consulting. And I started working with Scrum uh, which I've been doing ever since then. But then I found that the uh, the interesting, the challenging problems were always people problems. Then I met my wife, who's a psychologist, who essentially told me, look, you're more interested in people anyway. Go back to university, finish up your PhD, and, and start working with people. And um, so that's what I did. Not quite finished with my PhD for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, I don't want to talk about here, but um, I enjoy working with people. I enjoy uh, trying to understand why people work and act and think the way they do. And my focus, uh, my dissertation is on the uh, psycholinguistics of dyadic interaction, which means trying to understand what is the language that people use? What do they speak when they get to know each other? How does it change when they get to know each other better? And are there signals we can extract out of that to understand how people are getting closer or going further away from each other? And I've applied a lot of these skills. Um, it's actually, it's a two-way street. You know, 
having computer programming skills has helped me as a psychologist, developing statistical methods uh, to use for my analyses, but also being a psychologist has helped me a lot in the work that I do with uh, teams and organizations. Yeah, that's quite the intersection of skills. Uh, when you first mentioned it, I was thinking, man, there's there cannot be that many people in the world who can say that they kind of exist at that intersection of psychologist and computer programmer. So that in itself is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you've given a number of talks and, and part of the reason I invited you on the show is that psychological safety, given everything that you just described, is a, a passion topic of yours. Um, so let's jump into that a little bit and just talk about what it is and what it isn't. Okay. Um, saying it's a passion topic, it's not my favorite topic, but it's something I feel I need to talk about. And uh, the reason I need to talk about this, uh, I'm very strongly influenced by a quote from a psychologist who's helped me a lot during my career, who's uh, Nora Dunbar, a uh, communications professor at uh, Santa Barbara. And she once said in the psychology conference that as long as we real psychologists just keep talking with each other, essentially arguing with each other, there will always be those slick pseudoscientists filling the void with their articles and their talks and their training programs. And this is very dangerous and we need to do a better job of communicating real science to practitioners who can be helped by it. And psychological safety is a prime example of this buzzword. It's just the whole idea that, right, uh, psychology is about people. We're all people, so we're all psychologists. And when you do, you know, a, a scrum master training, you automatically get your PhD in armchair psychology from Google University. And <laughs> and this is the type of stuff that, that I and a lot of my colleagues have to fight against is realizing it's, no, it's not that. You know, both the field of psychology plus things like psychological safety are really quite different than that. Um, so that's that's the reason that I ended up having to, to talk about this. I'd actually prefer to talk about psycholinguistics of dyadic interaction. And that <laughs> right. I find a lot cooler. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I get that. I mean, there's a, a purpose that you feel of like protection for other people, because if if phrases are misused or misunderstood, they could actually be unintentionally weaponized. Like people with the best of intentions, but without the right education can use a phrase like psychological safety as, again, even unintentional manipulation. And so I totally get why this is important for us to be talking about. Yeah. And the... Along with that come these ideas that, oh, psychological safety means that uh, we all have to hold hands and sing Kumbaya after a retrospective, right? We don't because some, my coach made me do that. I'm just kidding, obviously. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, you know, we can talk about, if you need to talk about this, we can. I am a psychologist. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> this this is another problem of being a psychologist is that when you say you know you're studying psychology or, or a psychologist people always say oh my god you're analyzing me my normal answer for that is only if you pay me i have better things to do in my free time <laughs> right <laughs> and actually this is the the differentiator being a behavioral scientist is the focus my focus isn't on the individual in therapy my focus is actually on watching how people and groups interact and work together and how they how to help them get better at it and actually how to quantify that mm. because there's so much stuff you pull in some very expensive consultant and they come in and throw the magic pixie dust around and you're not quite sure has anything changed and how can we quantify that change how can we measure this in terms of something that's actually actionable like like behavior patterns yeah so what you're saying is that the consultants are not the saviors. <laughs> uh, some of us are, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I find though, like from what you just said, like I feel like, you know, equipped with the 
right information and with the right boundaries that any one of us can make change in our organization. Mm -hmm. And, but that education and those boundaries are really important because again, going back to psychological safety and not throwing that phrase around if we don't actually know what it means, but if we did to a certain degree, or we knew the difference between psychological safety and I know we're going to talk about trust here in a minute, you know, like if we can equip ourselves with the right information, doesn't make us psychologists by any stretch of the imagination, but we might have an impact just as a full-time employee in an organization, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what is psychological safety? Like define it for me in layman's terms. I would prefer to define it by contrasting it. Okay. But right, in what, what essentially it isn't. And as since you mentioned the term, uh, trust. Um, this is something we were talking about before, you know, how comfortable am I feeling now in my, my first ever podcast? Do I feel safe or not? And <clears throat> trust, trust is the currency of all our interactions. This is what we, we deal with. We don't deal with information or emotions, right? The amount of feelings you show someone, the amount of information you give someone depends on how much trust you have in that person. So trust is a, is a personal attribute, which means it has contextual and dispositional parts. Contextual means, right, in which type of situation would I trust you to do what? And dispositional parts as the amount of trust that I can give a person is often independent of that person. My personality also plays a large role in that. Am I introverted? Have I been hurt in the past? All that. So there's there's a mixture of, of both of these, right? And this is, there's a process. The problem is we humans aren't made to live alone. We're, you know, we're designed, we have this need to be together with others. But as soon as we start doing that, we become dependent on others and dependency in, in terms of risking being hurt. Right? Uh, a psychologist whose name I don't remember, unfortunately, once said that uh, uh, trust is the interaction of your hopes and your fears. No, I will go look that up and uh, put the author in the show notes if we can find it. Yeah, I, I have book. it in one of the books up there on the shelf. Trust is the interaction, your, your, your thoughts, and your hopes, and your fears. And there are a lot of car crashes that happen there. <laughs> yeah. So what happens is that when you become dependent on people, there's, there's this amb ambivalence, there's this fear, but there's also this urge. Mm. And a lot of the interactions that we have when we get to know people better is trying to establish what, what how far we can trust someone. Now... In contrast to that, <clears throat> trust is a personal attribute. Psychological safety is an environmental attribute. Right? Psychological safety happens, it's a, it's a derivative property. Derivative means you can't directly influence it. And this derivative properly emerges as a result of a self-organization process. So self-organization used to be one of these big buzzwords that people threw around that it's not that popular anymore. Now they actually found out that self-managed teams is probably the proper term. But self-organization is the development of behaviors at a meta level, at a higher level, based on interactions, actions and interactions at a micro level, right? And in a social environment, the actions and interactions of the actors of the agents in this system evolve certain higher level behavior patterns. And one of them can be psychological safety. So if people keep going around trusting each other in the personal sense, you will have an environment come out where you have the feeling that there's this trust there. And it's interesting how strongly environments can influence us and the way we act 
Let me just give you two examples just off the top of my head. Um, I don't know about you, uh, but my bedroom. When I go into my bedroom, I have a specific feeling that I have there because my wife and I have also agreed we will never argue in the bedroom. It's a safe place for us. Hmm. Or another one, churches. The feeling you have going into an old church. Now, in Europe, we actually have old churches. <laughs> but, you know, you have this feeling when you go in there and this there's the environment. And, you know, part of part of what I do in my work is there's an excellent video uh, you can find up on YouTube from uh, Shumitra Goshal from uh, World Economic Forum a couple of years ago, where he talks about the smell of the place. So he's, he's an Indian professor uh, who you know, compared spending a summer in Calcutta and you had that smell there and then going to, to Fontainebleau in Paris and just having that different different feeling and different smell. And this is one of the things that I that I look for in, when I go into an organization is just what does a place smell like? Hmm. Just in, in psychological terms. Do I feel comfortable there? And this is what actually what my research is uh, about, is trying to understand this. How can I measure this? How can I quantify this? And measure it in terms of things that are actionable. There are certain behavior patterns you will see in organizations that have this high degree of psychological safety. There are other behavioral patterns you'll see in organizations that don't have it. But so uh, I, I hope that I've been able to sort of allude to what I believe it is. Mm -hmm. I think another important thing is the fact that it's not sufficient. <clears throat> Psychological safety is a necessary but not sufficient condition for high performing teams. Right? And this is backed up by a lot of very interesting, very powerful research. And if you go into this research, what you find is that uh, there are three factors that are necessary. And it's interesting that all three of them have become buzzwords lately. Uh, <clears throat> one is psychological safety. The second is diversity. And the third is empathy. Right? Now, the original research that was done on this happened to, to be just in terms of gender diversity because they were doing exploratory research and didn't know what to look for. And it, they happened to find that the teams that did best in their research were ones that had a, a higher percentage of women in the teams. And they first thought, okay, oh, that's a moderating variable on empathy because women are normally thought to be more empathic than men are. But using the statistical methods, they found out that that has such a high factor loading that that diversity alone was an important factor. So what I've done looking at this and other research is trying to expand it and say gender diversity, racial diverse, ethnic diversity, all these types of diversities essentially in the workplace come down to what we call cognitive diversity. People who think differently. And what you need, you need this cognitive diversity, diversity of ideas in order for any organization to be innovative. But also what you need is the empathy, the emotional intelligence to be able to be accepting of others. And it's, it's an interesting game if you think through, if you only have two of the three, if, for example, you only have psychological safety and empathy, but you have no diversity of opinion, what do you get? User groups. Right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So if you have empathy and diversity, right, you have different, different ideas, you have acceptance of the ideas, but you don't feel comfortable expressing them. What you get is, I think of the Disney movie Frozen. Nothing ever happened. Hmm. And 
if you have psychological safety, you're comfortable expressing yourself, you have diverse opinions, but you have no empathy for the others. Anti-vaxxer demos. Oh my gosh, yeah. Right? So really, you, you, you need to find that sweet spot of having all three of them. And you can detect that by certain behavior patterns. And behaviors are the things that we can analyze and behaviors are the things that we can actually work on. Improving. So let me ask you that. If I am a leader in an organization, well, for sake of the example, I'm the CEO. Okay. Um, and I genuinely want all three of these things to exist in my organization mm -hmm. from my vantage point again as the ceo i'm not in the weeds every day mm -hmm. you know i'm not in with the teams every day how would i know how can i validate what behavior patterns can i see from my vantage point to know that those things exist or that they don't okay there are two ways of doing that and two types of analysis you can do. You can either ask people or you can observe people. Both have their good and bad sides. Asking people, right? People, this is something called self-report bias. People will give you the answers that put them in a good light and the, they think that you want to hear, right? So understanding that, you can correct for this bias. That's the easy way. Asking them questions. Amy Edmondson has a survey on psychological safety in the back of one of her books. It's actually a quite good survey. I use it a lot when I develop uh, tests for, for teams based on that. The other side, observing, watching people, how they interact, that gives you a lot more information. It's just a lot more strenuous to do. Now, referring to something that the two of us know, uh, a year and a half or so, we did a number of tests together. Remember? The purpose of those tests were for me to observe how a group interacted with each other on the certain different types of tasks that a team or a group actually does. And uh, <clears throat> interesting thing about these tests or exercises is that you know, often when I when I do a talk, I ask people, well, what does a team actually do? And you know the answers you get. They do what you tell them to do. <laughs> or they they yeah, you know, they provide value for the shareholders or all, all these type of things. This isn't these aren't answers, these aren't aspects that you can actually look at in terms of something you can quantify and be actionable on. So Essentially, psychological theory says that there are four things that a team does together. They have to be able to generate new ideas. They have to be able to choose between alternatives. They have to be able to negotiate and, and execute on something. And they have to be observant, notice things, and remember them and bring them in. And this is a challenge that you have if you don't have all three of these. Think about however, how often has it happened that, you know, you're looking for a, so, a solution for something and somebody comes in and says, hey, I have this great idea. And somebody says, no, forget it. That's stupid. Right? Mm. right? You have the diversity, but you don't have the safety and you don't have the empathy. You're killing any motivation to be innovative, any motivation to, to bring yourself in. And the problem is it's not any formal censure. It's more in terms of a social ostracization that people say, oh, Melissa, she's the one who has, always has those weird ideas. We're not going to go out to lunch with her. Right? <laughs> I do have weird ideas. Let's all be honest about that. <laughs> yeah, that's, why we, that's why we get along together. Right? <laughs> but uh, but yeah, this is a fascinating part about it. Another thing, um, before I forget that I want to point out, is that uh, there's some... Recently, um, there's a lot of work, a lot of talking being done now about diversity and about empathy. The recent Harvard Business Review article saying that, oh, leaders need empathy. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, a caveat here. 
psychological safety and diversity are traits where more is better, monotonically increasing, right? The more the safety you have, the more diversity you have. Empathy does not work like that. Ooh, okay. This research is from um, Simon Baron Cohen. Not the actor. Uh, <laughs> the, Everybody's uh, brain went there for just a split second. Yeah. And I knew <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's one of the world's leading researchers on autism. And he maintains that empathy is a bell curve. If you have too little of it, you're going in two possible directions, either autism spectrum disorder or psychopathy. Yeah. Total lack of empathy. If you have too much, though, you're getting into hyper empathy syndrome, borderline disorder, a high risk of burnout. You have to find a sweet spot in there. So empathy is not more is better. <clears throat> so this is getting back to, you know, how how can you measure this? How can you quantify this? And actually, these I prefer doing a mixture of asking and observing um, because obs observing how people interact especially in these tests and exercises that we do tell me in with very fine detail now which part of the team interaction isn't working well is it that part about they're not being comfortable bringing in new ideas is it the part that they can't make a decision and agree on it is is it the part that they can't you know negotiate and finally execute and do something that one happens a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So, and finding out that says, okay, this is what we want to work on. And how can we work on this? We can actually work on this by doing these tests and these exercises repeatedly and having a training effect come out of them. Mm -hmm. I had an interesting aha moment, actually. Um, so, you know how we always talk about hire for... Um, culture fit is not the right phrase, but, you know, hire for emotional intelligence, hire for, yeah. um, you know, thought, thought processes and like yeah. uh, soft stuff. You can teach skills. Right. Yeah. I was definitely trying yeah. to avoid soft skills, but that is what people say. Yeah. Um, but you can teach content. Right. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me when you were talking and especially when you were talking about like you know, the four things that a team can do. If the four, if the team can do those four things because they have psychological safety, empathy, and diversity, then you could almost hand that team anything. I mean, I'm, I'm being a bit hyperbolic. You're not going to hand them like, you know, uh, scientific research that's completely out of their realm or something. But, but generally speaking, like if you have a cross-functional technical team, that can do all of those things. It doesn't matter what product they work on. They could even, you probably could put them in front of, you know, some topic that has nothing to do with their specialty, quote unquote, I'm putting that in air quotes. Um, but because they can generate new ideas and they can negotiate them and they can, you know, execute like all of these things. And they I mean, can remember things and then bring them into the team. They notice right. things. Yeah. Then like the world is your oyster. I mean, <laughs> Yeah. But it's just so funny because we've we've talked about that way we've talked that way about individuals for quite some time. And I think in some circles we've talked about teams that way, but I think the way that you phrased it makes it very clear that essentially those four things are like the soft skills of a team. And if the team can master those, which means the team has to be stable ish mm -hmm. and you know there's got to be a willingness yeah. and have those three elements then man, there's like not much that team probably can't do, mm -hmm. um, which is just kind of interesting to think about that in terms of team. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one go on. thing to, again, to re remember about measuring this, you know, the, the big challenge, you know, any assessment says more about the person who wrote it than about the people who take it. Mm -hmm. Any assessment, right? Um, Kozibski, the map is not the territory. The map is a subjective reduction based on what the map maker thinks is important. Wow. 
And that makes me think about metrics, but that might be a yep. different episode. <laughs> well, that's another episode. Don't get me started on metrics and estimating. <laughs> but um, this is the problem is that I remember uh, it's like Maslow's hammer, right? And a lot of people just have this solution looking for a problem. And they're trying to justify it by doing some, some assessment that they've tweaked in order to have that as, as, as the answer. And I, I have, I had a psychometrics class at university once where it was fun. The professor came in with a bunch of business assessments, handed them out to us and said, take a look at this and tell me what these people are trying to sell. <laughs> and yes, yes, I design and I execute assessments myself. What I pride myself on is the fact that um, I, I try to in, approach it from the point of view of, let's say, being a doctor, right? Uh, if you go to your doctor, they'll first ask you, they'll assess you before they figure out what's wrong for you, with you, if anything is, and then look for a therapy based on that. And with this, the, the, the assessment work that I do, it's I don't have the answer. And there are a number of possible solutions. And yes, it might be that you want to have invest more in psychological safety. Yes, it might be that you want to invest more in diversity. Yes, it might be good to have some emotional intelligence training. There's a wide number of possibilities there. And that's what, what I've been looking for in my work is trying to find a neutral basis for this. Hmm. Or if, you know, you might have to work on generating new ideas and becoming more creative and find out is the problem that you're uncomfortable bringing in the ideas because you're afraid that people will laugh at you? Or is it the fact that you know, there are people who are more creative. There are people who are less created. You need some diversity there. I have an interesting client who scored a bit lower in terms of diversity. And when we talked about this, what they discovered was that their client base was not diverse Ooh. and started realizing if, you know, not only putting all eggs in one basket, but putting also in terms of domain, putting all their eggs in one basket, if they started diversifying in terms of the clients they had, they would also attract more interesting, diverse people as employees. Well, that's an interesting tie. I don't think I've ever considered before. Yeah. So very cool. Yeah. I want to ask you one final thing around just the psychological safety kind of topic that we started out at, at the beginning. Um, because what I what I think I hear you saying is that, well, first of all, you've said it very clearly that it's not enough, right? It's not sufficient. Yeah. Um, is there harm in us pursuing psychological safety in isolation? Um, and I know you mentioned earlier, like psychological safety without the other things. Um, yes, there's harm there. But I guess what I'm asking is like, What's the main, what's the main fear that you have that makes you speak out against sort of misunderstanding this topic? Uh, <clears throat> I think that well, th this goes back to, there's a famous saying from Eric Hofer that I often quote that says, you know, every great cause starts as a movement, turns into a business and eventually degenerates into a racket. Now, between you and me, and we'll say this loud, this is what happened with Agile. I, there's also something that, that's happening you know, in, in terms of a couple months ago, I saw a post on LinkedIn. You can win psychological safety for your team. It costs $1,600, but you can enter it in a drawing and win this. You get one video lecture and then you get you know, some uh, books and exercises and stuff. And then you, you go through that and then you'll be have psychological safety. And no, my, it, my face just went from like incredulous to sad to, I cannot believe. Yeah. Uh, it's, 
scary, especially since the person who posted this is someone, let's say, who should know better. But, uh, and this is why when I said that, you know, what causes me to speak out, I think a good common sense, simple common sense exercise is when you, you know, go to a conference and see talks or workshops on this or watch something or read something on the internet. How many psychologists are talking about psychological safety? Quite honestly, I hardly know any. Wow. I think that's, that's just, you know, uh, a, a reality check on this. So what's the silver lining? I don't know. <laughs> you got me on that question. <laughs> well, I hope that the silver lining is that, I mean, yes, there's some clear potential commoditization. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I was able to say that word the first time. Some potential commoditization of this phrase. Mm -hmm. But I do think there are many, many well-intentioned people mm -hmm. that are seeing this as, yeah, I want people to feel safe on my team. <clears throat> and I want people, uh, leaders that want people to feel safe on their team. And while we may have a, a misunderstanding or are falling short of what it means, that if we can pursue that intent, if we can pursue that like purity of heart there, Mm -hmm. that that can only send us in the right direction. There is no silver bullet. I mean, that's what I yeah. hear you saying is like, yeah. there's no, you know, purchase this course and you, it's just like, like you said, it's like agile, you know, there's no like, Oh, now you're agile. Um, but if we can continue to pursue that <coughs> desire for people to create an environment for each other, where we can be innovative and we can be creative and we can be kind. Yeah. Um, to me, that is the silver lining. It's like somewhere in there is like really good stuff. We just need to A, equip ourselves to do that properly and B, avoid the commoditization of that purity. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree. There are many well-intentioned people out there trying to do this. And I like helping people who are well-intentioned and don't know who to go to for advice. Um, things like that. It's just, you know, <clears throat> I think doing anything in that direction is probably better than doing nothing. Mm. Quite honestly, I think I've often been asked this question about, okay, this, this triad of safety, diversity, and empathy, where do you start? <clears throat> I think one of the easiest points to start with is diversity and inclusion. Bring that, bring that in will often, it will force people to be confronted with that, which once again, has good or bad sides, but, um, I think that's the that's the easiest point to to start. It's something that doesn't cost any training, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Stuff like that. Just be open and inclusive. And one thing, one thing I've learned, I learned a long time ago, but I realized a lot more in the past years where I was flying over four hundred thousand miles a year all around the world. Uh, and this is something that a lot of people in certain countries don't realize. We are all foreigners in over 99% of the world. And we are not entitled to anything. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think, think I need to sit with that for a second. Because <laughs> it's yeah. true. I think, you know, just just honesty and humility are actually very good traits that are quite often uh, uh, it could be some more of that. I agree. Well, you mentioned that you like to work with people who are well-intentioned, um, who 
want to know more. So if people are interested in finding you and reaching out to you, what's the best way for them to either get in touch or find out what, what you offer or what's going on? Um, well, you can find me on LinkedIn, but please, if you write to me on LinkedIn, uh, do write a little note and say where you heard about this and why you're getting in touch with me. This is actually an interesting thing you know, from in cognitive psychology. When we do tests, we have something called an attention task. Attention tasks are these little questions that you shove in in the middle of the quiz just to make sure that people are paying attention. And uh, I actually had one on my profile down at the bottom of the text to make sure that people actually read the whole text. <laughs> And nobody did. So I've, you know, I normally don't hook up with people who don't bother to tell me why. But then I move that attention task up to the top, like the first sentence in my profile saying, look, please, you know, happy to hook up with you, but please write me and let me know why. And a lot of times people still don't. <laughs> so that you can, uh, or you can find me, my website is just josephhellrand.com. Uh, there's also an alias to that. Uh, I don't know how long I'm going to keep this. AgilePsychologist.com will end up get you on the same page. You can find out more about me there. And you can also, there's a form to send me uh, a message. Awesome. So the final question that I've been asking everybody this season, and it's been so much fun to hear the different answers. Um, when you first heard about the podcast, Wild Hearts at Work, and you heard that phrase, what did that phrase mean to you? What do you think a wild heart at work actually is? Um, one of the things that I teach in my classes is um, if it's not fun, you're doing something wrong. And work, it's, it's something we do to earn money, but uh, it has to be, it should be something since we have so much we spend so much time doing it, right? And what we need more at work is passion because it's not going to be fun all the time. It's just grunt work you do. But having passion to do this, finding something in that work you do that you love, and that comes from the heart, and that's where it is. And if you find meaning in your work, if you have passion for your work, you never have a problem getting up and going to work any day. I love it so much. I love it. Well, Joseph, thank you so much. Thank you for showing up and uh, allowing me to be your first podcast host. And thank you for the work that you do in the world. I think it is so important. You know that. Um, but I think it's important to share on this podcast in particular, because I know we have a lot of folks out there who are so well-intentioned and are doing amazing work. And so I know we've all learned a lot from you. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It was, it was a joy. Awesome. And to you, my dear friends, thank you for joining us this week on Wild Hearts at Work. It has been such a joy to share this with you uh, week after week. And I uh, just want to remind you that uh, you can like, you can share, you can subscribe, tell your friends, tell your boss, um, we also have a Patreon if you'd like to support the show. And then lastly, you can always find me at melissaboggs.com. Until next time, dear hearts, stay wild.